Hey there, Golden Bear family. Hey, last time we left off where we have uh, 13 colonies, they're splintered, uh, kind of fragmented, uh, sensing that something is changing, something that that the intolerable acts are causing tension between England, sensing a king, uh, George III, that is not responsive to the needs of his people, uh, sensing that uh, quartering acts and other aspects are being forced upon them. The colonists are faced with a decision, and the, the decision is, uh, do we continue to remain loyal, or do we pursue our own path? So with that, I want to start with a story, and it goes back to the Rose Bowl in 2001. Um, I uh, used to be, and, and still am, uh, I'm a big college football fan, and back in the late 90s and early 2000s, I was a University of Washington, go, do, you know, go dogs, a uh, fan. And uh, there were a few years that I actually went to the to the Rose Bowl. And one year, one of my good buddies, he kind of is well-connected in the L.A. scene. And he got us tickets, really good tickets to the Rose Bowl. And uh, my UW was playing against the Purdue Boilermakers. Just so happens to be Drew Brees, the quarterback currently uh, at the of the New uh, Orleans Saints, uh, was the quarterback. And uh, it was going to be a good game. And uh, we got pretty good seats, and we had included with us this big, not a field pass at all, but it was just official-looking AT&T Stadium Rose Bowl thing. And I had on a purple shirt, purple hat that looked pretty official. And um, it was now halftime. I, I made a run for the restroom. And while at the restroom, I started to notice, since it's such an old stadium, the Rose Bowl, I started to notice some of the coaching staff from UW. And I'm like, dude, what are these coaches doing in here? This is weird, but I guess it's an old stadium. The coaches have to come out of the stadium and use the same facilities as the people in the stands. It's like, oh, okay. So I had immediate thought. I looked at my friends and I go, dudes, follow me. So we see the coaches start peeling away. They have the same looking badges as mine in some regard, hat and all purpled out. And I just get right on the heel of them. I make it to the first gate. I'm now walking down underneath the stadium, passed to a second big guard with a yellow jacket on and doesn't even see me. He sees me blending in like I'm the coaches. I don't even look back to see if my friend's with me. I'm like, dude, I'm there. I can now, underneath the stadium, I can see the grass field ahead of me. I walk through. I'm on the heels of another coach. I, I just kind of keep my head down. I, I make it past the third third yellow jacket and now my feet are standing there on the grass of the hollow ground of the Rose Bowl 2001 with my UW team in front of me and the Purdue Boilermakers on the other side. I'm looking around. I'm like, oh my gosh, is this for real? I kind of keep my head down because I don't want to be kind of noticed as what's happening. I walk to the 30 yard line right onto the cusp of where the coaches have to stand inside the 30 and where the non-coaches stand. And I just sat there and I, I looked around to see if any of my friends made it. Nope, they didn't make it. I continue listening to the band. I continue to kind of see what's going on. I keep waiting for that proverbial touch on my shoulder. Sir, are you supposed to be here? No touch happens. Second half kickoff takes place and you should hear the crowds roar. It was incredible. It was, I've never experienced when 100,000 people are at a stadium and all their voices are directed downward for this. But it was kind of cool being on the field out here. Great play by UW. And the whole one side of the stands would go, whoa. And then you would come back on the other side and Drew Brees would make a great play on their side for the Purdue Boiler Bakers. Woo-hoo. And it was just a great thing. I'm not going to tell you what happened to me necessarily by the time fourth quarter struck. But what I want to share with you in my story is that this is precisely where we begin seeing the colonies begin to kind of drift into two camps. One that's going to be loyal and one that's going to be specifically looking to become a, a patriot. One that wants to adhere to these new ideals and the Declaration of Rights and Man that is coming out of Europe and this whole Enlightenment thought. So as we move into the next slide, just be mindful that there are some factors that play into the 13 colonies moving towards and beyond protests and boycotts to eventually declaring their independence from their forefathers of England. Another thing that we need to bear in mind is that not everybody was interested in this. And there was a lot of discussion and dialogue going on, even within the first and the second Congress and, and all these meetings that happened subsequently. 
Well, the first thing we need to recognize is there's not one, but there's two Continental Congresses just to keep you confused. But each of them has their own distinct qualities and attributes that I think are worthwhile that we need to pay attention to. First of all, in the first Continental Congress, if I'm not mistaken, all but one of the colonies were able to show up. And it is there that they began to kind of declare that they have rights and protections that are afforded them as Republican idealist people. Meaning, back in the last lecture, if you remember, that the ideas of the government is to provide for the will of the people. And it is the people that determine how the government should respond. Well, here many people were sensing that the king was not responding to the will of the people and they began demanding their rights. They began declaring that the, the British king is showing his tyrannical behavior. Uh, hence this British Tories thing that I talked about in the last lecture. And it's time for them to do something about it. These delegates all met and it was there that they began discussing what should they do in terms of writing a letter to the king. We call it an olive branch. This is our last chance, King. Listen to our letter, read it clearly, because if not, um, we're going to kind of fight against this. It's, it's kind of like, you know, the liberals versus the conservatives there on the screen, that there's some that, that, that want a lot of change, and there's others that don't want any change. The liberals would be the patriots. They got really nothing to lose. You know, the, 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 um, the conservatives are, are the, ones that are representing the loyalists. They might lose a lot if this thing goes on. And so there's a lot of conflict taking place between them. But what was in the letter that this First Continental Congress sent over to the king for them to you know, read about is the boycott of British goods that we are going to do this, listen to us. Why is this important to us? Because the, the, the American colonies almost bought over 50% of the gross domestic product coming out of England. This would dramatically influence England, who's also trying to pay off all its debts from all the different wars that it's had in the past five to seven years. We're going to end all exports going to Great Britain, and we're going to actually establish our Continental Army. It was here that they began declaring George Washington as the best candidate. We began trying to prepare our soldiers. Now, I wish I had time to talk to you about how a country as, as small as England uh, with 7.2 million people and, and the colonies with 2.8 or 2.9 at this time. But there is no way that the colonies had any sort of military power or navy to match what was going on. There's a longer story behind that. And uh, maybe if you're part of Steger Select, I'll have a chance to chat with you about that. But you need to recognize that what is unique about the First Continental Congress, and I have it there for you, that the Albany Plan put forward by Benjamin Franklin, not you know, eight or nine uh, years or so before saying, come on, folks, let's get together. Let's find a way to be unified in this. And they basically chopped up the snake. If you remember that picture, they couldn't come to terms. Now, all of a sudden, they're putting aside their differences. They're picking up their pints of beverage and they're finding reasons to come together to fight a common cause. It is there that a rupture of problems begin to happen across the landscape of primarily Massachusetts, those darn rebellious people up there. And we begin seeing patriot groups going around gathering weapons and storing them in houses and town places across the outer regions of Boston. We see propaganda going up on walls and, and in conversations at churches. We see local military men, the Minutemen, as you've probably been taught, are beginning to kind of become loosely affiliated with one another. They began having spy networks watching everything we, we see that the British troops are doing. And then there was a small little town about 20 minutes of modern day driving outside of Boston in Lexington Concord, where there was the first shot heard around the world, they like to call it, where on a small little bridge, no bigger than what two cars can pass over, was a skirmish that took place between some men in there who were kind of tormenting and, and, and attacking uh, the, the redcoats that were training in the field nearby. It was this skirmish that was a trigger point that enabled um, the, the colonies to begin finding reason for them to move forward. Well, soon after that, a Second Continental Congress is convened. Why? Because the letter was summarily dismissed. Why? Because the king began sending over more and more troops in order to um, kind of make sure... Uh, uh, 
Boston is on lockdown, sends more to New York to make sure they're on lockdown, is sending more to Philadelphia to some more on their lockdown. And basically this idea of do we negotiate with them further when they've already dismissed our first letter sent during the first Continental Congress, or do we fight? Well, that is decision is made quite handsomely and easily because on the next slide, you see that the British show up and they begin immediately attacking different parts of Boston. They begin a, a major fusillade of, of, of firepower using their boats and other things and also on higher parts of Boston, Charleston, that essentially, yes, the British had won, but at a tremendous cost to their amount of soldiers that were there. It wasn't a, it was a victory, but it certainly came at a great, great cost. What is important about this, that Second Continental Congress declares unequivocally that George Washington will be our appointed commander in chief and, and basically declares war on England. That is the other significant part that we need to know about the Second uh, con uh, Congress. Well, because of Washington now coming to power and the Second Continental Congress to saying, we will begin funding you officially, we'll begin declaring this Continental Army as something that we need to support. Um, there were two things that, um, that, that Washington was going for. One is to make sure that we can get the British out of Boston and that area as much as possible and as quick as possible. And two, let us make sure that we aren't going to be attacked by other British forces. During this time, uh, King George III had no problem and he had deep treasury pockets. He was actually in contact with Native American tribes, not he personally, but his emissaries. And he was saying, hey, if you promise to join in this fort, we were going to give you the lands beyond the proclamation line and, and more than that. Um, to the German people, they were called the Hessians. He hired over 50,000 of them to come overseas and to sit there and act as part of his army uh, so they his people did not have to be involved. Why? Well, many people in England actually were bothered by the fact that you have Britain fighting other British people. Uncles fighting nephews or, you know, sons going over and shooting cousins. And so there were some battles even within Parliament of saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, how are we shooting our own kind? And so this forced King George who was frustrated at the Second Continental Congress to use actually these soldiers, like I talked about, the Hessians, to kind of help fight, not kind of, but to be instrumental in fighting. And that's the whole famous scene where you see George Washington on Christmas Eve going across the Potomac and attacking them. Those weren't British soldiers that he was attacking. Those were Hessian paid-for soldiers that we were attacking in order to eventually bring about a defeat. And they kind of scurried off and says, I'm just paid to fight. I'm not that big uh, commitment to this type of thing. Well, it was during this time that Lord Dunmore, you know, went to African Americans, as you can see there in the notes, and said, we promise to give you your freedom if you come to our side and fight. This was huge declaration because down in Georgia, down in the South, uh, those types of slaves there would be very instrumental in kind of creating another pocket of, of problems for, for those in the colonies. And so, this was an important kind of uh, plan that the British people had wanted. And they also sought out uh, Native Americans in this time period. But what we begin to see, and you've got to pay attention to the timeline that you see there in my notes, that this is November 75, the Dunmore's Proclamation. It's still not quite America, not Americans, but the colonists are like, well, yeah, we kind of think we need to have independence. Yeah. Uh, but we think France will come in and help us because they really hate England. And we know Spain wants to stab England in the back for what had happened in the prior wars. So if we get military assistance from France, maybe we'll be good. Well, the military assistance in France doesn't show up until later on when we talk about a turning point in the war. But at least it's held out as a possibility. So still the, um, the colonists aren't quite on board with the reason to join in this conflict. But it isn't until January of 1776 that a relatively obscure person comes over from England. He picks up, he's a corset maker. Uh, you know, that's what kind of helps keep the stockings up beneath the dress. And he writes this pamphlet that has two declarations in it, uh, Thomas Paine's Common Sense. And in this pamphlet, with over 110,000 of them being read or bought and read, 
he argued two things. One, how is it that our rights as, as individuals have been usurped by a tyrannical king? And two, how is it such a small country as England can dictate the terms to a group of people who are 10, 15, 20 times their size? Why is this happening? How is it whenever a, there's no way in nature something so small can control something so big? This made sense to the American colonists, and they took this book by storm and began disseminating it and, and discussing it, etc. Here you begin to see, I love this statue where um, after the King uh, George III ironically had repealed some of the taxes, uh, people here in New York City actually erected a statue to him in his honor made out of lead. Uh, kind of a fun, whimsical thing. A few years before, he was awesome and, and put into this pedestal. Here we see him in, in July of 1776. His pedestal was being pulled down by some African Americans, three African Americans in the area. And once that statue is pulled down, ironically, it was converted into lead bullets that they used as part of the battle that was going to take place, uh, we now call the American Revolution. Um, with that, I get close to, uh, uh, you know, conclusion on this of our Declaration of Independence. We finally now have uh, enough colonists on common ground, common experience, recognizing Thomas Paine's words having a resonating effect on us. This idea that there is a social contract that a government must have, this natural law that it is there meant to serve people, the religious freedoms that we've been promised. And so over 55 delegates came together, some of the smartest and best and brightest of the day, and they turned to a man named Thomas Jefferson, a 33-year-old uh, bright, young, rising lawyer, and said, hey, take these ideas of Henry Lee that he is espousing that we need to be a group of united uh, nations united, and somehow turn that into some sort of note we need to send off to the king. And there it was on July 7th, or 2nd, that he, he officially presents it to the group, and there on July 4th, the signatories were there, and they send that off to declare themselves independent from the king. You can see that most colonists try to sit there and say, well, I got a business and a family to feed. I don't know my thoughts on that. Half said, oh, heck yes, doodle. Let's, let's go to independent. But still, a fifth wanted to remain loyal. Where were those fifth? Most of them were down south. Remember, down in the Georgias, the South Carolinas, and into the, um, the Chesapeake Bay area. They were forced to change sides, I mean, choose sides, and, and many um, opted based on the one-fifth of the half, but one group that was sought out was that of the American Indian allies. And as you know, the Indians continually have been frustrated at being pushed off their land, pushed off their land, pushed off their land, heading west, west, west. And despite the proclamation line of 1763, they still felt that they were being um, encroached upon. And so the, the British felt that they had a very easy job of encouraging the Native Americans to join with them. Why? They just kept saying, look who's here, these colonists, have they ever shown good intentions? No, they've never honored them. In fact, look what they've done from the Paxton Boys riots to Mawatan's war. Um, all of those times, your people have been hurt. Who wants to stay out of this skirmish? Well, don't forget the Quakers and the Mennonites. They refused to pick sides. Remember, they came here as Germans and like, dude, this is your issue, not my issue. This is your king, not my king. We're just here to live in liberty. And there's been no problem up to now. But all of a sudden, you all think it's a problem. No, we're not going to do this. But there was an all-in effort, for the most part, from women uh, being participatory to it, to even uh, the... Uh, to the uh, African-American movement people uh, started to join in, and I'll, I'll talk about that in another subsequent lecture. Um, so choosing sides, as you can see here, um, is, is there were certain loyalist strongholds in this. You can see the predominant mounts of them are down south, uh, where, where you see major towns, where there's churches, where there's industry, where there is trade centers, that is where you found the greatest degree of loyalists. 
but out in the interior, out in the frontier, where there were farmers, and where um, what makes this unique and why the colonists eventually, you know, um, you know, don't want to ruin things for you. Hello, uh, what do they call that? Like a, you know, uh, I'm going to wreck the information for you. Watch out, here it comes. Yeah, the colonists eventually win. Okay, but um, you can see the interior. The navy of, of the British was incredibly powerful, the most powerful in the globe at the time, but the navy can't get to the interior. And this was the colonists, one of their most major strategies is that they couldn't, the, the redcoats couldn't find a way to get in there, let alone replenish their troops like they want. And I'll be talking about that a little bit later, but you need to recognize that there are definite strongholds and there are definite loyalists uh, between that uh, during this time. So a quick summary, we need to recognize that because of the intolerable acts, same thing as the coercive acts, uh, we see a lot of colonists begin to say, we're tired of this, we're weary of this, with the, the Continental Congress failing for the first one to be receiving that letter. By the time we get to the second Continental Congress, um, we have an America, I'm sorry, colonies that are officially coming together with Thomas Paine's common sense leading us on the charge to begin joining, seeing the king as our nemesis and our enemy. All right, well, let's take a little breath now before we jump into our next module 3.4 and talking about the winning of the war for independence. And uh, so with that, I want to, of course, always start with a little story here. I can remember uh, there was construction going on around my house uh, around the early middle school years in sixth grade or so. And I can remember my friends, Danny and Joe and, and Jason and David, uh, we went over by this construction site and they had a bunch of uh, big uh, dirt movers that were there. I mean, big, you know, big things, the tires as tall as we stood at the time. And, um, and we were just silly sixth graders and don't want to go home and do homework or do chores or any of that type of stuff. And I can remember that we kind of teamed up and we loosely started playing a dirt clod fights because there was a lot of with the earth movers there they had disrupted the dirt and so one earth mover was kind of about 30 or 40 yards away from us and so don't know how we picked our teams but somehow we just ended up being joe and myself were on on and david were on one team and, and jason and danny and others were on the other but uh, so uh, I can remember literally, I know this is stupid and you ask yourself, they literally were throwing dirt clouds at each other. Yeah, that's just what we did before parents checked up on us and made, picked us up before and after school. You just did everything on your own. And of course you made stupid choices like that. And so, you know, we weren't intentionally trying to hurt each other, but we knew if we got hit, we were out. And so I can remember, you know, the first game or two, we were pretty evenly matched and one of us would hit that person and put that person. But there was one time as we kind of game got closer and closer, there was me and Joe on, on one side and Danny was the only one left on the other. Now we didn't know this at the time because we all just grew up a bunch of slappies, but Danny ended up being, he, he's incredibly smart. He's got 155 IQ. We didn't know how smart he was until the college years. And um, so uh, Danny outsmarted both of us. And here's what he had done. He, he realized that he was outnumbered. Joe and I were kind of working around from both sides. We were going to kind of go up and tag team it and make sure this guy was out. Guess what the guy had did? He, he totally outfoxed us by, he picked up a couple of dirt clods and he threw one of them up in the air. So while Joe and I are like looking at that in the air, he literally took two other dirt clods and while we're looking up he threw them and hit us smack dab i got hit in the chest and joe got hit in the leg and all he could do is sit there and sticker as he took out two guys still looking up and we're realizing we just got owned by danny he taught the victory taking us out like that and that reminds me of what is happening here is for the colonists in order to defeat um this world power of England, they have to come up with some trickery. They have to come up with some strategy. They have to come up with some good luck that everything's going to come together. And it just so happens to be that all three of those things come together. Now, it doesn't come together quickly. It takes a lot of help from other neighboring countries and, um, and some diplomacy and some fiction and everything else. But let's hope and see how this story unfolds for us here. We need to recognize that there's a lot of factors that led to the Continental Army to win the eventual Revolutionary War. 
There were a lot of losses, but there were some two key battles that we need to pay attention to at this thing. Uh, that this changes brought about by the Revolutionary War really affected the role of women, and that it affected how other nations saw us as a people group and as a new nation. The first part of the critical years of the warfare, July 1776, when we just declare independence, it kind of begins starting quickly, right out of the door. The British are doing well. They're kicking our booty, taking names. You can see between July and December, there was not one single victory our um, army had had under General George Washington. And when we get into the winter months, um, we begin... The British are like, oh man, we got to travel across an entire ocean. This rural fighting is complicated for us. Um, none of these colonists are actually engaging in war-appropriate behavior. They're like doing guerrilla warfare. And so this, by the time the winter months began coming around, you can see both the North and the South, you know, working together to supply and regroup the Continental Army that was there funded kind of initially by the Second Continental Congress. So the urban versus rural is what really helped uh, um, the colonists have a chance. Because if we had nobody in the rural willing to fight and, and draw out the military of Britain in any way, it might have been an easier battle for, for the Britain to destroy just the colonies if that was along the coast. And so, as I've told you in the last lecture, we have the Hessians who are there fighting. We have Washington attacking them on Christmas Eve, surprising them, and kind of getting the first victory uh, there for George Washington. And the press really loved it. Now, another victory came upon it is this Battle of Saratoga. And it's a long, drawn-out story between General Howe and Borgonia of, of Britain and their they're kind of hubris about how they were going to go defeat George Washington up in New York and his ignorance as a general. It was just a lot of hubris by, by the British. But ultimately what happened at the Battle of Saratoga is that while Burgundy was kind of sleeping and taking an easy chill pill thinking that everything's going to be fine, he gets surrounded by Washington who had snuck down there, not in the middle of the night, but in a rather quick way and quick fashion. And he had to surrender one of the most leading uh, award-winning generals uh, of the British Empire at the time uh, had been defeated. What did this do? Well, it instantly kind of became a windfall for the Americans. And I'll, I want to come back to the role of women here uh, in this shortly. So even though the supplies were, were minimal, what did this victory at Saratoga do? And you need to remember this and put a little star on that. The victory cemented that France now sees America, the colonists, as contenders. What? Contenders? You mean that they actually might win something? Well, maybe not. But France was certainly willing to stick it in the back, stick it in the front, stick it in the head, stick it anywhere they could to get back at England for what they had done to them up in Quebec and, and, this, and, and, and along the, the Great Lakes and also including in England and in Europe. So this was a unique opportunity that France was like, yeah, we'll join with you. What else does this do? It legitimizes the colonists as being seeing a legitimate country that will someday maybe be their own. This is a unique thing in the political, geopolitical world, and it made a very powerful statement to the colonists at that time. Let's take a little moment to look at how women had contributed in a significant way. And when we do the Steger Select, we're going to read some documents and unpack them together. But we need to recognize that while the men were gone, suffering insufferable conditions, uh, ragamuffin clothes with barely any enough things to keep them warm and fed, etc., you had women taking over the duties at home while the men were at war. You had the women intentionally raiding the stores and warehouses of loyalists, people who were loyal to the king, in order to send those hoarded goods off to the front lines. We had them working as spies against the British and giving them information to the continental forces. You even allow some of they went and joined their husbands in disguises in order to join them on the battlefield and, and to assist them, kind of like Mulan did in the whole Disney type of situation. I encourage you, if you want to drill down more, there's a great video on that that you can 
watch there's a hyperlink or you can go to this uh, website on the left hand side of your screen called the Daughters of Liberty, the women who fought in the revolution to kind of examine that more. There's a great thing here that I want to talk about when I do the Steger Select, but look at the romantic notion of this gal, Molly Pitcher, on the left hand side to the authentic Molly Pitcher on the right. Look at her leading the charge and, and helping take over on the front lines. What a great reference point this would be for you as an outside source if we're talking about the role of women in, in the uh, American Revolution. So in 1777, the Continental Army um, was doing well kind of at the beginning, but then the winter came. The supplies were scarce, and this is where we begin seeing European allies kind of stepping in to bring in either supplies or training or experiences. Baron Friedrich von Steuben shows up, and he begins putting Washington soldiers in their most bleakest of time. He's putting them in the training regimens. He's saying, this is how you fight. This is how you repel. This is what you do in, in order to um, act as a real military. You have a Lafayette helping stir up some strategy that was necessary for uh, to repel the British naval forces. There's a lot going on. You have Ben Franklin over there in Paris trying to serve as a liaison to convince them to say, sign a treaty with us. Let England know officially that you will back us up and you will fight to the very end, either towards our victory or both of our defeats in this. This set a, a, a tremendous concern for the King George of uh, King King George the Third of England because he's like, oh my gosh, now I got to engage not just the colonists, now I got to engage with France again. This is not going well. And the final like nail in the coffin, if you will, October seventy-seven. You need to know this: the second crucial turning point, and that's like me the dirt clod fight. The turning point. I Joe and I thought we had Danny. You know, he's one, we're two, we're ready to take him out. The turning point was, Danny, throw up in the air, the, the dirt cloud. We're looking like ignorant blokes. Kaboom, kaboom, we get taken out. What happened here? Same thing in, 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 in this little area, not little area. I'm going to show you a picture here um, of a map uh, shortly of it. Uh, you have uh, in this yellow area that you can see towards the top of the screen is this Yorktown, the Chesapeake area. And this area is is really um, a harbor and in this harbor it was easy to kind of access some the, the the rivers going up well during this time there was a lag in communication with the British Navy and there was I wouldn't say their strength diminished but they certainly weren't in place to put on a full-on assault uh, in that region to repel what the colonists were doing during that time down in the French Indies, um, the, the, there was a communication given saying, get up here quickly, get up here quickly, because we think that we have a chance of taking out the, the British General Cornwallis here. So up comes the Navy of the French. They blockade the few ships that were there. You then have the American colonists coming in and basically at Yorktown causing the surrender uh, of the British troops in a matter of a few days in Cornwallis again, another um, celebrated uh, general uh, defeating the British at a second turning point there and ultimately becoming a turning point that leads to the colonies getting their ultimate freedom on that. So we need to recognize that France's joining with us was incredibly important. So again, Saratoga is the turning point that said they should join us. And by them joining us and giving us help, uh, when all seemed bleak as the Continental Army, we see tremendous support and victory at Yorktown taking place during this time. What was the result? The famous Treaty of Paris, where uh, the King of, of England, King George III, had to admit that they were done and over. Uh, his parliament had says, King, we're done with fighting them. Don't you remember? They're really our kin anyway. This has been foolish that we had happened. But in the whole situation, remember all the promises that were told to the American Indians? Hmm, we'll find out next time to see what happens to the Native Americans in this. Just by way of summary, you need to recognize that the American Revolution has a lot of major events that you need to be mindful of. You have the colonial responses, what happened in the War of Independence, 
and this second revolution that's going to be called the Constitutional Convention of 1787 when we begin talking about that in subsequent things. So, hey, uh, keep it classy, Temecula. We'll see you next time.